Hey, what's up guys? Today, I'll show you a horror anthology film, Unholy Women. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story, entitled Rattle Rattle, begins with Kanako with her fiancé, a divorcee. The fiancé stops his car near Kanako's apartment building, and while in the car, he receives multiple phone calls from his ex-wife. The fiancé shuts it off and gives Kanako a beautiful pair of pearl earrings. After their goodbyes, Kanako walks home, when a verse hits her shoes as it rolls on the ground. Kanako looks up as she hears rattling sounds, when an earring suddenly hits the ground. Kanako takes a look at it, and is weirded out upon realizing that it looks exactly like hers, only the pearl has blackened. Kanako looks up again, when something heavy suddenly falls on her, knocking her out. As she wakes up, Kanako sees a little girl looking at her. Kanako concerningly asks if she is okay, as it is too late for a child like her to be out. Kanako steps towards her, when she hears the rattling sounds again. Kanako looks where it comes from, but cannot find it. And then, the little girl suddenly vanishes. Kanako talks to her friend on the phone, while treating her head wound from the incident. She ends the call as she finishes treating her wound, when she suddenly hears a strange voice. Kanako immediately checks her apartment as she is alone. Her phone rings, and as Kanako answers it, she hears her fiancé's agitated voice. He informs her that his ex-wife suddenly showed up, wounded him, and ran off. The phone call suddenly ends, and Kanako finds steam coming from her bathroom. Although scared, Kanako investigates the bathroom. Fortunately, there is no one. However, a creepy woman in a red dress suddenly appears in her apartment, holding a knife. The woman trembles in anticipation of killing, but Kanako knocks her out with a varse. She lies on the floor before getting up like she did not just get hit. Kanako runs away, but the woman chases her throughout the complex. Kanako hears the rattling sounds whenever the woman is near. She runs to the streets and goes inside a police station, but there is a note informing her they are out on patrol. Kanako stays there for a while to hide, but then she hears the rattling sounds again. Kanako looks up, and there she is again, in the top corner of the room, staring right at her. Kanako hurriedly leaves the station and finds a group of people in the streets, circling around a dead body. Kanako tries to call their attention for help, but they remain moveless. And then a little girl shows up again, and she points out the broken vase on the sidewalk. Kanako remembers an insane woman in the complex, who always looked at the memorial vase of her dead daughter, who fell from the apartment. The mother looked from above, and spent her time holding the rail despite any weather. The little girl vanishes, as Kanako hears the rattling sounds again, so she quickly runs inside an apartment complex. As she climbs the stairs, Kanako runs into several inanimate people, one of which has a strangling mark on her neck. She points out a way, so Kanako runs towards it, and hides inside an apartment. However, she soon discovers that it is seemingly the woman's lair in red. Suddenly, a tremor shakes the apartment, and Kanako sees the woman in red. She begins to contort, as she walks toward Kanako, who falls out of a window when she tries to escape. The scene then reveals that what knocked her out on the streets that night, was actually a person who committed suicide. The woman remained unidentified, but her hands got fused with Kanako's body, so the doctors had to operate for long hours. After the operation, Kanako was in a coma, and everything that had happened was made by her imagination. She also learns that the woman in red is not her fiancé's ex-wife. In fact, she repeatedly called him to inform him that she would be remarried. After recovering, Kanako decides to visit the little girl's apartment, where a neighbor informs her that the insane woman, who kept looking down on her daughter's memorial, actually committed suicide by hanging herself. The neighbor adds that there is someone who jumped off from the same spot recently, leaving Kanako much more confused. The little girl and her mother suddenly show up, and they try to tell her something. Kanako sees the strangulation mark around the mother's neck, and realizes that the mother was the one who helped her previously. The two abruptly disappear, and night replaces the light as the woman in red returns. Several hands grope Kanako's body, one of which turns her pearl earring black. The woman in red pushes her to the rail, and Kanako realizes that everything that happened had been a loop and she's been trapped inside. She sees herself walking on the road, making her realize that the woman who fell on her is none other than herself. The story ends with the woman in red revealing herself as a monster, before throwing Kanako to her death. We can deduce that the loop is possibly cursed by the ex-wife, who's filled with hatred and jealousy toward her ex-husband's new lover. The following story, entitled Hagerne, begins with a teenager mechanic, who applies for work in a mechanic shop. The shop owner forces the mechanic to go on a date with his sister named Hagerne. The next day, when the mechanic arrives at their residence, he sees Hagerne using the sewing machine, with a burlap sack over her upper body. The shop owner waits outside with the mechanic, as Hagerne changes her clothes. 
After a while, she goes out wearing a miniskirt and a pair of red stilettos, with a burlap sack still covering her upper body. Throughout the date, Hagerne continues her weird behavior. She does not speak, but only lets out strange noises and growls. Hagerne even runs around the streets, occasionally hopping in delight as she does so. She also throws herself into the river, and when the mechanic tries to help her, she drags him into the water using her feet. Because of that, the mechanic has no choice but to return home with Hagerne to change his clothes. As the gentleman he is, the mechanic offers his clothes for Hagerne, but instead, she kicks him to the window and crashes him with her body. This causes the mechanic to accidentally push her to his bed. However, instead of getting mad, she writes the word, more, using her foot and the mechanic's blood. The mechanic hesitantly dismisses his strange date's behavior and begins to caress and kiss her legs and thighs. As he reaches the thing in between her legs, he asks for Hagerne's permission to untie the ugly sack, so they do a decent exercise. Hagerne agrees, and the mechanic begins to untie the smelly sack. However, halfway through, the mechanic sees what appears to be her open flesh under the sack, which scares the hormones out of him. This enraged Hagerne, so she kicks the mechanic out of her legs and trashes his home before running away. Later that night, the mechanic listens to the shop owner's voicemail, informing him that Hagerne likes him and hopes to have a second date with him. The following day, the shop owner goes to his stop and finds that the mechanic has already resigned from his job. Meanwhile, while walking on the streets, the mechanic gets targeted by wooden nails shot by Hagerne. The mechanic tries to run away, but Hagerne chases him and continues to shoot him. Fed up, the mechanic beats her with a piece of wood. But then he backs down when he gets his arm wounded by spikes, protruding from Hagerne's sack. Hagerne writes the word more again using her blood, lies down on the ground, and waits for the mechanic to make a move. However, instead of satisfying her kink, the mechanic drops a hollow block on her, causing her to wriggle as she lets out growls of pain. After that, he picks up a piece of wood and repeatedly beats her with it. The mechanic returns home, where he hides as the shop owner visits him, asking about the job at Hagerne. The mechanic does not open the door and remains silent until the shop owner finally leaves him. Later that night, the mechanic takes a walk when he sees Hagerne walking limply. The mechanic follows her and catches her as she collapses. He uses this opportunity and throws her off a cliff. However, Hagerne returns unharmed and chases him. So the mechanic runs away and hides in a warehouse. But then Hagerne, with her newly opened hand, opens the door and cries in the mechanic's arms. Another hand comes out from the sack and Hagerne tears it until the mechanic sees her inside. He puts his head in the smelly sack, causing a chomping sound. However, he begins to get hurt, so he breaks free, revealing his face covered with bite marks. They both fall from the impact, but Hagerne approaches him and opens her legs wide, inviting him to devour her. This time, the mechanic satisfies her needs. Then, moans of pleasure and chomping sounds fill the warehouse. But soon, it turns to muffled screams as Hagerne eats her mate. The shop owner, who is driving, accidentally discovers them. So he burns the mechanic's remaining belongings while Hagerne cries. The story ends the next day with the siblings getting on with their lives like nothing happened, and the new recruitment post is made for the next victim. The last story, entitled The Inheritance, begins with the mother singing a lullaby and inviting her son to come into the shed with her. The little boy walks toward his mother, leaving his sister alone outside in the night. The scene then fast-forwards to Siko, returning to her childhood home with her son to take care of her elderly mother. However, her mother expresses her dislike of them being there. She hates that Siko chose to divorce her husband, breaking up their family. Later that night, the son gets a glimpse of a young boy outside the house, who quickly vanishes. Shortly after, Siko shows up and catches her son staring at her family pictures. The son points at the young boy's picture, and Siko informs him that it is her brother. Siko continues the story in the bedroom. Her brother disappeared in the past without a trace, and no one knows if he is alive or dead now. The son tells his mom that he saw her brother, but she dismisses it. The following day, Siko reunites with her childhood friend, who is now a social worker. Later that day, while looking at childhood photographs, Siko hears the shed chain clanging. She goes in, thinking that her son is there, but she finds something else. She sees a wooden chest with a scroll inside. So Siko takes a look at it. However, whatever it contains shocks her to her very core. As she returns to the house, the son notices his mother acting strange. She begins to smoke and changes her clothing style. Siko confronts her mother as she remembers that the night her brother disappeared, her mother was in the shed. She woke up in the middle of the night and saw her brother go inside. Later that night, the social worker takes the drunken Siko home. The son greets his mom, but she tells him to sleep outside and dismisses him. The son cannot sleep without his mom on his side, so he looks for her in the bedroom. But then, he sees her walking toward the shed. He 
He follows her inside, and finds her upstairs, singing a lullaby as she combs her hair. The son escapes when he accidentally slips off the steps, causing Seacoat to notice him. The following day, the son confronts his mother about being in the shed last night, but she denies such accusations. Later that day, the social worker arrives at the house, and notices the strangulation marks on the son's neck. At first, the son does not want to admit that his mother strangled him. But he soon tells the social worker the truth. Meanwhile, Siko's mother calls her husband, and hurriedly tells him to take the son back to Tokyo, before it is too late. However, Siko takes the phone from her mother, and says that the son will not go anywhere. Shortly after, the social worker confronts her about the strangulation marks on her son's neck. However, she denies the accusation, and calmly tells him that she will not hurt her son like that. She instructs her son to apologize to the social worker for lying, and as he is scared of her, he obliges. Later that night, Siko locks her son inside the shed, leaves him there, and returns to the house. As she returns to the house, Siko crawls as she removes the scroll from her room, and throws it into the fire, while screaming in agony. Left with no choice, the son wanders into the shed, and goes upstairs, where he sees his mother. He discovers a child's skull presumed to be her brother's, which causes him to see a vision. There, he sees his grandmother luring her own son into the shed, and holding him in her arms after killing him. It turns out, the scroll is cursed, and it caused his grandmother to kill his uncle, and now it cursed his mother again, who might try to kill him, in the same way as shown in the scroll. Fortunately, the son gets freed by his grandmother, but instead of running away, he runs toward the house to look for his mother. However, he soon realizes that his mom is gone. She's now possessed by the curse of the evil scroll. The son runs away, but he gets cornered. Siko walks toward him, and apologizes all of a sudden before embracing him. The story ends the following day with the social worker arriving at the house, only to see Siko's mother babbling. Meanwhile, Siko is in the shed singing a lullaby, while holding her son's lifeless body, the same way her mother once did after killing her brother. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.